Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Teresa Marantet, CEO and Chief Nursing Officer of the Windsor Essex County Health Unit. I will now report our current case counts. There are 635,134 confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Canada and 204,145 cases in Ontario. Chatham-Kent has 842 cases and Sarnia-Lampton has reported 1,090 cases. Michigan now has 512,751 cases with 26,485 cases being in Detroit. Today we are reporting 201 new cases of COVID-19 in Windsor and Essex County. 51 cases are related to outbreaks. Six are close contacts of confirmed cases. One is community acquired and 143 are still being investigated. We have had 9,246 cases since March. 6,554 cases are now resolved and 2,490 people are active cases at this time. 93 confirmed cases are currently in the hospital and 15 people are in ICU. Our community has lost 202 people to COVID. 134 deaths have occurred among residents and staff in long-term care and retirement homes. We are reporting 12 additional deaths today. 10 people from long-term care and retirement homes, a woman in her 50s, a man in his 60s, three people in their 70s, two women and one man, four people in their 80s, three men and one woman, and one woman in her 90s. Two people are from the community, a man in his 80s and a man in his 90s. We know that every one of these people have families and friends that are mourning for them and our thoughts are with you. There are currently 39 active outbreaks in Windsor and Essex County. 20 are in long-term care and retirement homes, 15 workplaces, three community outbreaks and one hospital outbreak. Vaccination of residents, staff and essential caregivers of our long-term care homes continues. Another home will be vaccinated today. Additional homes are booked throughout the weekend. We continue to work closely with all homes to get people vaccinated. Despite the rollout of vaccine, please continue to follow public health measures. Stay home if you're sick. Limit your close contacts to your household members only. Maintain a two meter distance from others. Wash your hands often with soap and water or use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer. Wear a non-medical mask or face covering. Cover your nose and mouth with a tissue or use the inside of your elbow when you cough or sneeze. And download, download the COVID Exposure Alert app at Canada.ca. I will now turn it over to Dr. Wajid Ahmed, our Medical Officer of Health. Good morning and thank you for joining us. Yesterday I was asked the question on who's getting the vaccine and who should get the vaccine at this time. We want to vaccinate everyone as quickly and safely as possible, but we cannot ignore the ethical distribution of the vaccine. I'm disturbed by the fact that with the limited supply of vaccine, we are throwing away the prioritization list and are completely ignoring the ethical framework that is provided to all of us. Vaccines are not for healthcare workers who just want a shot. There's a clear guidance to say that do not prioritize vaccine based on seniority or rank. Healthcare workers working in these areas are at high risk of acquiring the disease and includes COVID-19 units, COVID-19 assessment centers, critical care units, critical care response team, emergency department, general internal medicine units. These are the healthcare workers who may have a high risk of severe disease or outcome from acquisition as well as passing it on to the population that they serve. So first, you have to belong to this group and secondly, your function has to be critical for the healthcare system capacity to serve the population in this pandemic. If you have extra vaccine, give it to the healthcare workers based on the prioritization matrix and not based on who wants it. We must use the vaccine appropriately and not only avoid wasting vaccine, but also not to create 
a, a, a sense of discrepancy in terms of uh, uh, creating this uh, parallel structure where some are, get, some are getting the vaccine when other people who need the vaccine are not getting the vaccine. The Windsor Essex County Health Unit will continue to use the scientific evidence and the ethical framework to vaccinate people and to distribute it in a timely manner. I can argue every one of my staff is critical to the operation of this health unit, given how we are working nonstop for the last 10, 11 months, but it will ethically, morally, will be wrong for me and my team to do that. My goal is to ensure that the vaccines are distributed quickly to the right people, and there shouldn't be any queue jumping or any favoritism on vaccine distribution. So let's stop the distraction on the non-issues and start focusing on our community that how we do the right thing instead of distracting everyone with non-issues. Thank you. I'll switch on to our EPI uh, summary for today. So starting off first with the with looking at the daily new confirmed COVID-19 cases around the world, and this is what the picture we are looking at. Cases are increasing everywhere. We have seen a huge increase in the cases from UK. The um, uh, United States continue to show the high number of cases and leading the country in terms of the overall cumulative case counts. But as we can see, the most important and notable uh, country is France with a huge spike back in late uh, October, early November with the strong implementation measures right now at this time among the countries compared, they are doing better than anyone else, including Canada. Canada continues to be on the trajectory of having more cases, but these cases continue to be uh, increasing at a pace which is much better than the rest of the countries that are in comparison here. Uh, Mike, Mark. Okay, um, so looking at the daily new confirmed uh, deaths per million population and then just looking at overall mortality, we can see that uh, right now at this time, uh, UK is leading in terms of the, the daily new confirmed deaths and um, a lot of that has to be, the, is linked with the new COVID strain that's been spreading rapidly in the in, in, in UK. There's a mass vaccination campaign going on at this time in UK to protect all these people. And then when we, when we look at what's happening with the rest of the country, we can see that yes, Canada's death rate is also increasing, but among the countries that are compared here, we're still in a much better position compared to many of these countries. So now focusing just on the number of cases in Ontario. So this is what the picture looks like. We continue to be in an upward trend. We have seen some dip a week uh, ago, but then we started to see the increase again. Right now we are consistently reporting, um, the province is consi consistently reporting more than 3,000 cases. And yesterday they reported their highest case count of 3,500 uh, in, in Ontario. So comparing that with the epi curve in Windsor Essex, so we are on a similar trajectory. We have seen a, 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 a quick dip in the number of cases, but then we continue to be on the path of uh, reporting close to 200 cases a day. And that trend is continuing as we, uh, we continue to deal with the pandemic in our, in our region. So looking at this particular graph with, when it comes to cumulative cases and deaths of COVID-19 in Windsor Essex, as we can see, and we talked about that this particular graph, the way to interpret it is, is to look at the steepness of the curve. The steep the curve is, that means the worse we are doing. And as we can see, starting in November, our curve is getting steeper and steeper every day. And we, are, uh, we have already crossed 9,000 cases in just a short period of time when our total cases were close to 3,500 or so for uh, beginning the month of, I believe, October and uh, early November. So similar picture, if you put the, all the cumulative deaths in Windsor Essex, this is what it looks like. We have seen a very a, a sharp increase in the number of deaths in our region in the early phase of the pandemic. And then we have seen the plateau and the flattening of that uh, curve, uh, the death curve. And then uh, as we continue to move further in the last couple of months, we have seen that we are reporting every day new death. And as Teresa mentioned, and we have reported it many, many times, all these deaths, all these people, their families, 
they're individuals they are just not the numbers for us and we care about each of all these people and then we we really want to draw the attention to the 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 straggling number of deaths that are happening here and what is our role in terms of preventing many of these deaths in in our region so comparing our week to week case rates and as we can see we are we are seeing an uh, ever increasing number of cases in our region with uh, with everything that's happening around and every month we are every week we are seeing an increase and this particular week we have gone all the way up to um, 340.8 cases and a seven day moving based on a seven day moving average for Windsor Essex which is the highest in the province and again it almost from the from the uh, from the curve, we are looking ourselves at uh, going further uh, high in, um, in in terms of our case counts. So comparing our case counts with the provincial average as well as the southwestern Ontario's average, what we are looking here is uh, while the cases are increasing everywhere uh, in in other parts of Ontario, and even in southwestern Ontario, our the, the jump in our cases is uh, is much significantly higher than there than there than the other regions. So this particular graph is showing the um, uh, the um, the wastewater surveillance data, and uh, it's as we mentioned that this is a collaborative effort with the uh, Great Lakes Initiative um, uh, Research Institute from the University of Windsor and uh, Windsor Essex County Health Unit. What we are looking here is the the some comparison in terms of our cases as well as the the prevalence of uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus in the wastewater data. We have seen most of the time these data correlates with the number of cases that we are seeing in the region and as we can continue to see that there are still the a significant number of uh, SARS-CoV-2 viruses found in the sewage data suggesting that uh, there are still people who continue to be in our community and uh, maybe whatever we are looking at it could be an underreporting of the actual cases that, that we have in the community. This is the figure that looks at like at, at all the tests and the unique individuals tested by week in Windsor Essex and in total we have tested more than 206,905 tests uh, as of January 2nd and for the week ending on January 2nd our person positivity is 12.3 percent which is the highest in the province as we can see that there was uh, we had person positivity of close to 1 percent 2 percent in in the weeks of August and September and early October it started to increase and it's still on the upward uh, trajectory for our region. So in comparison of based on a seven day rolling average, this is what it looks like. We are person positivity is the highest in the province, uh, uh, followed only by Peel and York that are very close to us, but the rest of the uh, community, we have a person positivity of even less than 2%. So this particular graph breaks it down the person positivity by age group. Some of the data we shared yesterday as well when, when we were talking about the school age based age children. But this particular graph shows you the person positivity uh, and break broken down by the uh, by the age group. And as we discussed yesterday, with respect to our school uh, closure discussion, uh, between zero to seventeen, the person positivity is highest, close to twenty percent. And then followed by the uh, the young adults, which is eighteen to thirty four, and then onwards. This is just a focus from starting September to present and how it, it fared starting September. We started to see a high percent positivity of, um, um, of cases in among the age group between 0 to 17. And most of them uh, were from uh, obviously were belong to the age group where children are attending the school. This is again another way to look at the daily number of tests by age group and it gives you a picture of who is getting the test mostly in, uh, in, in our region. And this is just focusing again on between starting from September to present. So when it comes to daily number of test results that are coming back with the large number of testing that's been done due to our high number of cases, 
and the, the logistics of um, uh, getting all these test results back. We are approximately receiving 21.4% of tests that are being processed with the results available within one day of being tested. This is very low compared to where we would like to see. We would like to see at least 50% or more cases returning coming back to us within the 24 hour timeline. When we are when we are talking about the two days being tested, 75% of these tests are being processed with the results available. Again, this is this is much lower than what we were seeing uh, back in uh, November and uh, in our other parts of a um, uh, 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 timeline of our pandemic. But um, this is something that's uh, that's that's important from a lab capacity perspective and what's happening with the lab system. Looking at uh, uh, comparing our test results that how quickly it's coming back compared to some of the other regions and, and as you can see we are uh, our test it's taking longer for our test results to come back uh, for our region but as we have reported earlier there uh, the there will be another lab in Windsor who will, that will be able to process our PCR test uh, for our region which would uh, help us in terms of getting the results uh, back quickly uh, for our community. Looking at the regional and provincial rate, uh, Windsor-Essex currently now has the second highest rate in Ontario. We have surpassed Toronto, even though Toronto has a lot more cases than us. Based on our population size, we are seeing much higher cases than in most areas in the greater Toronto area. Looking at overall how these cases are distributed uh, within, the, within each of the municipality based on uh, the rate uh, per 100,000 population. And we can see and we, we know that uh, due to the um, uh, temporary foreign workers, agricultural foreign workers, the uh, Leamington and Kings will continue to have the highest proportion of the cases based on the rate of each of these municipality. And, and then what we are looking at is the uh, city of Windsor with the highest case rate uh, overall uh, starting from the beginning of this pandemic. But when we are when we are look when we are focusing on just the data from December first to to uh, present, uh, Leamington continues to have the high number of cases, and then followed by the the city of Windsor, and then Tecumseh and Kingsville, and uh, the lowest number of cases so far uh, in the month of December is from Lakeshore. Looking at overall distribution of cases of COVID-19 by municipality, and this is right from the beginning of the pandemic, the majority of the cases, no surprise here, came from the city of Windsor with the large population size, 55%, followed by Leamington and Kingsville, while many of the other jurisdiction um, have a similar number of cases between three and 4% uh, in, in other municipalities. So focusing on just the last 30 days, uh, city of Windsor is still uh, continues to to see um, the, the highest proportion of the cases in the region, uh, followed by Leamington and Kingsville, while we, uh, so Leamington and Tecumseh, Kingsville, and then the, some of the other municipalities are also seeing cases uh, distributed pretty much equally between, uh, between many of these municipalities. Uh, just in the last seven days, 62% of the cases are coming from the city of Windsor, while the rest of the municipality have roughly equal uh, equal proportion of cases uh, in, in the county. Looking at the age and sex distribution, we have seen an increase in the number of cases in the last two weeks based on uh, the, uh, the higher case rates in the younger population. We have seen an increase in the cases between 0 to 19 in the month of December. Um, and then also um, the, uh, the increase in cases between 20 to 29 years in particular, and, uh, and then followed by 30 to 39. But what we are seeing is now the trend is changing again in the last two weeks because of maybe the schools are out at this time. And uh, most of these cases in this population is relatively a manageable level compared to the overall cases. But what we are starting to see is again is an increase in the number of cases in the older uh, age group in the last two weeks. So if we, if we look at the graph, anyone who's older than 50 and 59 in the last two weeks, they are, they are the increasing group, uh, in, uh, they, they, they are the one that we are seeing the increase in the uh, percentage of cases in that group. And as we can see that uh, if people with older age and with comorbidities, they develop most of the severe complications of it. So this graph shows you the exposure history and as 
you know, we report every day that the number of, there are a number of cases that are currently being investigated and we don't have all that information, but uh, this particular graph, when we make that contact, when the investigation is completed, we put that exposure source to identify as quickly as possible that where these exposures are for reporting purposes. So this is again, just for the reporting purposes, it's not for the purpose of investigation. Our investigation starts immediately within 24 hours to 48 hours. They are, everyone who's positive, they are getting a call from uh, the um, uh, um, from the health unit or on behalf of the health unit to go in isolation and follow up with all the, the public health protocols. So you can see that the cases are still distributed everywhere. There are, there are cases that are resulting from household contact and most of these household contacts every, in, in, in situation when some uh, someone brings it inside the home everyone in the home is uh, is getting sick and contracting COVID. But we can see that it's still, it's everywhere. We are seeing community cases. We are seeing travel related cases. We are seeing outbreak related cases. We are seeing household contacts and close contacts. Looking at the acquisition source by municipality, similar picture. It's coming from every direction, but mainly it's coming from the household context. And as you can notice that there are still a uh, uh, number of cases uh, which are uh, under investigation based on the uh, based on the acquisition sources. But um, um, it's some of these smaller municipalities, but there are low number of cases. Uh, it, it may mean that there are a few acquisitions that we still um, um, haven't put up for the purpose of analysis, but for the purpose of investigation and follow-up, those are all happening. Looking at our active outbreaks, as we have reported time and time again, that the number of active outbreaks in the region are increasing. Um, back in October, we can see that there are very few cases, but then starting November and all the way up to uh, December and now January, we are, uh, we are reporting more than 40 outbreaks in the region. Looking at the hospitalization and ICU data for COVID-19, this is what the picture looks like. We continue to show an upward uh, trajectory in terms of the number of cases and the hospitalization. Um, and uh, as we are reporting regularly in terms of number of people that are, uh, that are dying uh, in, our, in our region. Uh, looking at the current outcomes, we have more than 70% of the cases resolved and as we have seen that uh, there is a large number of proportion, a large proportion of people who are currently self-isolating or active cases, even though what, uh, what it's reported as unknown and 23.1%, um, most of these individuals are currently self-isolating because we have close to 2,500 of uh, active cases in our region that, uh, uh, that is being followed up by, uh, by, the, by the case and contact managers uh, to, uh, for, for further instruction that follow up. Unfortunately, we have lost up to 2.1% of uh, uh, all these cases that happened in our region. Um, we have uh, reported the number of deaths uh, in the time when we are receiving those uh, details. And then once we are getting all these numbers back, our team investigate to make sure that they are cross-referencing every death with them and not duplicating any of these deaths. So we are doing our part to ensure that uh, there is no discrepancy or inaccuracies when it comes to the data, uh, when it comes to the uh, death reporting. Sometimes we are reporting a death few days after when the, that actually happened. So I, I put in this graph just to give you a perspective in terms of the actual date of people when they died, just to give you a perspective that uh, it's not the, so let's say for example, if we're reporting 12 deaths today, that all, not all of these deaths happened yesterday. Some of them happened before. And so this, this, this graph gives you a picture of exactly when uh, these deaths happened or the number of deaths happened. Looking at the age and sex breakdown of COVID-19 deaths, uh, no surprises there. We continue to see uh, more mortality um, starting all the way from 60 years and older and the highest in the 80 plus age group. Uh, this is a, this is a graph that, that has changed significantly in the last month. We were we were doing much better in terms of the case fatality rate when we were comparing ourselves with the province and the Ontario long term care home uh, average. We are now getting very close to the provincial average, even though we are still below the provincial average. But we are getting really close, really fast. Uh, to the provincial average, which is a concern because we were doing much better as a region when it comes to saving lives, 
but in the last month or so we have lost so many lives and i i can truly understand how each and of each, each of these families are going through but this is something that's concerning uh, and we should all pay attention to Looking at the doubling time day over day comparison, this is what it looks like. Uh, Windsor did fairly well in the month of September, October, but then we started to see uh, the, that the doubling time getting shortened day by day. So even now we are at a point, but we are coming closer to the rest of the, uh, rest of the provincial average as well as the Canadian doubling time. Looking at the median are not effective, what we are seeing here is the most recent estimate, uh, which is 0 0.91. And when, as we have reported earlier, when you have a, an R not of greater than one, that means every infection is causing more than one new infection. If it's lower, it means that our case counts are decreasing. Right now we are at 0 0.91 and uh, it would be too early to say that uh, have we peaked and now we are starting to see a decline. I'd like to hope, uh, I'd like to see that happening, but uh, we are just going below one, which means that the, every new case is, is producing less than um, uh, one case, uh, which is, uh, which, uh, which signifies the important that the, uh, the measures are bringing the case counts down. So in summary, the case rates in Windsor Essex is increasing at a rapid rate, much higher than the provincial rates, and the acquisition sources is distributed between household contacts, close contacts, outbreaks, indicated uh, widespread uh, community transmission, and the cases are coming from everywhere. We cannot say, we cannot say that there is one thing. That's that's why it signifies signifies the imp that it's everywhere, and it's spreading rapidly. Even though when we are reporting some of these these uh, uh, acquisition sources the virus is spreading very quickly in the community. So by default, that's why I've always said that anyone you are meeting, anyone you are coming in close contact with, they can have positive, for, they can be positive for COVID. And if you're not taking your precautions, you can contract COVID. And what we have seen in the last month or so, we don't know if, how, if and how much prevalent we have uh, the, 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 the variant strain of COVID in our community. We don't know that, but the amount of cases that are adding up every day, I would like to look at that option and would like to have more data from the, the gene sequencing and from the provincial and national lab to see what we are dealing with because clearly that uh, uh, our spread is happening at a much higher rate that needs to be uh, contained. COVID-related hospitalization continues to be increased, and as we and as we have reminded again, uh, there are at least three, uh, so our two hospitals with three different units that are currently in outbreak. That's a significant problem for our community. We have to understand that there are as a, there's a healthcare resource that is stretched. We know that there are healthcare workers; they're stretched. We're talking about redirecting many of these uh, uh, patients to different hospitals from a surge perspective. It is a significant concern. We can talk all about it. We can wait. We can, we can argue one way or the other. Doesn't matter. As a community, we are struggling here. And that's the, that's the real issue. That's the problem that we have to face and then we have to solve. Day over day doubling time in Windsor Essex has decreased. Uh, dramatically, which and again, just a reminder that day over day doubling time when it's decreased, that means it's worse. So we are doing worse than the provincial, provincial average as well as the Canadian average. And then the R not effective value is 0 0.91, which is a slight glimmer of hope that maybe our cases will continue to go down from this point onwards. But again, it's too early to say it's just an early indication and would like to continue to monitor that. Thank you. We'll now take questions from the media. Today we'll start with CTV. Good morning. Um, I guess with another grim milestone surpassing 200 deaths in the region, many in long-term care and retirement homes, are you optimistic that once the homes are vaccinated, the number of deaths will start to decline? 
So we have to recognize that the vaccine takes at least 10 to 14 days to build that immunity, even with the first dose. And we know that the first dose is not sufficient to develop the, uh, the enough immunity in individuals to keep them protected. The clinical data that we have from these companies, it suggests that the vaccine effectiveness could be between 94 and 95 percent based on which vaccine you're getting after completing your second dose. So I would I, I would anticipate that uh, the it would take some time to build that immunity. The number should go down, but I wouldn't say that it will just stop everything completely. But that's 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 the only best option that we have right now. And uh, the, as quickly as we completed all our vaccination or completing our vaccination in the long-term care home and retirement home, um, uh, and again, as we have said, that any home that's prepared, we are offering them the vaccine. It's not a hold up on the on our uh, on the health unit side. So any home that's ready, we have worked really hard. There is no provincial guidance at this time that how do you vaccinate the uh, the homes in an outbreak. Our health unit has provided that guidance that how do you move forward quickly based on the evidence, based on the scientific data to help expedite the process instead of waiting for the province to provide us with all of those details. So those the actions that are in our control, we are doing that. We will continue to do that, and we're hoping that as quickly as we put that extra protection for these uh, uh, residents and workers, we should be able to save more lives, and we'll continue to find more ways, more better ways, scientifically, evidence-based, ethical-based, and we'll continue to support them. And regarding your statement about the vaccine at the beginning, um, are there other instances of people jumping the queue to get the vaccine or was that more a proactive uh, statement? No, I, 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 when I, when I said that I'm disturbed by the fact, I truly am because our whole work in public health, we always put all of these considerations in place. And maybe that, that when people don't understand that, and especially people who are influential, they think that why they are not getting the extra privilege that they should normally get, we don't. We work in a very professional and ethical way. And I was disturbed by the fact by knowing that, uh, you know, uh, some of the executives, uh, our, our, our leadership team members are getting the vaccine. It's not right. There are clear guidance. There are clear criteria, protocols that have been identified. There's a scoring system that if I want to get the vaccine, I have to be vetted on that scoring system to see what is my score. And if my score allows me to get the vaccine based on the priority, even like, let's say, on the highest score, if I have 100 people, that's that's where I should be targeting instead of saying, that, oh, well, who is available? Let's just vaccine. If I, you want the vaccine, if you want to be on the list, you come in and you get the vaccine. It's not a, it's, it's not a competition to just to quickly administer the vaccine as quickly as possible. You have to think about the ethics of it. You cannot just go on and say, yes, I have the vaccine. I can start people, anyone who's walking down the street and start jabbing them with the vaccine and say, hey, I have finished the vaccine. I've completed 5,000 or 10,000 or 15,000 of vaccine because I just did it. It's not that. It's public health decision-making, evidence-based, ethics. There are clear guidelines on who to vaccinate and how to vaccinate. So. Some of that is obviously proactive because we are getting those questions, but also some of this is just just the fact that it's 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 unbelievable for me and for my team to go through and do all the work and figuring it out that yes, all of this, it really doesn't matter. If people want the vaccine, they're getting the vaccine. And just because they are critical, I am critical. Every one of my staff is critical. We know we have talked about it that we are all under resource. There are other critical staff. You have the utility companies who are running and ensuring our water, our electricity, everything. They are critical. If something happens to them, we will be out of water. We'll be out of electricity. They are not being prioritized at this time. Everyone can have an argument to say, yes, I am a priority. I am critical for the operation. If, I, if something happens to me, our, we cannot function. That is why we need some national guidance. That is why we need some provincial guidance and all of those are there. So it's really disturbing to see that if it's not being followed and it's just based on everyone, how they're feeling about it. And if they have the ability to get it, they should get it. And, and again, as I said, our priority, the health unit's priority is to vaccinate the long-term care home and retirement home people who need it. 
even when we are talking about the sub-prioritization, my priority is the resident, because we know the healthcare workers can go to the assess to, to go to the vaccination clinic and get their shots. The essential caregivers, especially if they're elderly, if they're old, if they have a partner, they have difficulty in going to the uh, to the to the uh, clinic site and get vaccinated. They are my priority. There has to be some ethics involved, and and I'm really uh, disturbed by that. That you know, it's if it's not being followed, it's 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 a blow. It's a blow in everyone's face that you know you're not important because you don't belong and there is some sub uh, prioritization based on who knows who and who can get the vaccine it's not right okay thank you any questions from cbc yes good morning you can hear me right um when it comes to long-term care homes how many are still to uh, be vaccinated Um, so we are doing our, I believe it's our 15th today, and uh, on the weekend, we'll, we'll, if all goes well, we should be finished for long-term care homes. But um, we do know that there are some, you know, anything could happen, but um, we, uh, hopefully on Monday, we can say that we have completed our long-term care homes in Windsor and Essex County. Uh, yesterday at the Windsor Regional Hospital meeting, uh, David Moucher said they're expecting about 3,000 doses weekly um, until the end of January. So they're going to start a pause come the 24th so they can give those people the second dose. Is there anything like that coming from Moderna, the, the vaccines that you're giving to those long-term care homes, or should everything um, be okay dose-wise and will you start vaccinating others after? So um, we have been uh, s supplied or allocated uh, of, of limited amount specifically for the long-term care home residents, uh, essential caregivers and staff. And so we do have a uh, stock for two doses for that population um, only at this time. Um, and Dr. Ahmed, um, as we're like the worst in the province and you had mentioned that France had a really good lockdown that actually got those cases to drop. Any thoughts of imposing stricter measures here or asking the province to do so? Well, I think uh, um, I don't have the authority to enforce that kind of measures. It has to be some kind of a provincial direction. And we our recommendations from a public health perspective is very clear, but recognizing that there is this fine balance that how much restrictions that we want to impose, impose and what kind of unintended consequences that will arise from these strong uh, restrictions. It's a very tough balance. And as, I and as I said yesterday, my guiding light is always finding that right balance and focusing on public health. And then if we continue to find ways that are within my control, within my authority to protect the public health, I will move forward and do that. But all of these things or many of these things are beyond public health. And then there are different lenses that we have to use. My lens is health. And again, even if it puts others in a question that you are not caring about me for X, Y, Z reason, my answer is I am caring about the public health. There are other governments, there are other ministries, there are local governments, there are local leadership, there are local agencies that are responsible for many of the facts. We talk about mental health. There are agencies for mental health. When we talk about the concerns about the economic well-being, there are agencies that, that deal with that. There are government uh, departments who deal with that. So as, as much as I like to have the answer for every question, I don't because there are these, these groups, there are these agencies, and I think it would be really important that we should ask these questions to them. What have they done in terms of providing this and what is the solution that they have? For me, I did what I could in terms of uh, taking a stand with respect to the schools, but I'm glad, I'm really happy to see that the province come out and uh, came out and then made that decision about the schools for the province, looking at the provincial data but those are the things that I can do. Any kind of further restrictions and imposing of stricter measures, that's beyond public health domain, and that's why we need the government. And uh, so far, the, the province has done a great job in terms of taking the right decisions at the right time, and I'm confident that they will continue to do that as we deal with this pandemic.
Any questions from Blackburn? Yes, good morning. Um, right now, the uh, staff that you certainly stretch resources and things like that. Um, but with the community spread the way it is, um, would like mass random drive through testing like was done in the summer be beneficial right now? Well, I think, uh, um, again, uh, when, when we're making all of these decisions, there has to be a right balance of what are we trying to achieve? And I think, yes, we will, we may get a better sense of what's happening with the, uh, with, with the community uh, as a spot test to understand the distribution um, of cases in the community. But I think at this time, if people are following the instruction, and I've said this again, and, I, and again, it's not a blame to the people. I think the majority of people are following the guidelines. But even if you have 10% who are not following the guidelines, because of the exponential spread, they will continue to spread it. And that's what we are seeing right now. We are in lockdown. And I've said it again. That means people stay home. They do not leave home unless it's for a really essential and critical reason. Otherwise, they have to stay home. They're not supposed to see anyone. If we were following that, we were not. We would never see that many cases that we are seeing right now. So clearly, something is missing. Either people are not getting the message, or people are not following the message. And we can test as many as as we want, but we don't want to give that sense to that to say that oh just because we don't know who is sick and who is not, and that's the problem. No, it's not. The problem is people are not following the measures. And if we have the resources, we talked about the lab capacity. If we start sending, let's say 5,000 more tests every day, that would significantly impact the lab's ability to send us the results back. And if we are not getting the results back in a timely manner, we won't be able to track, trace, and isolate all these people in a timely manner. So there is this fine balance that we have to find and then see what measure is the most effective measure and that's the public health question it's not about what are the range of measures that we can offer and then we can maybe start putting resources on the measure that has a limited impact we want to talk about the measures that has the maximum impact there is not enough resources in the world to deal with every crisis every situation prioritization and resource allocation to the right thing is critical and our health unit have always done that and will continue to do that and as needed if we if the the best use of the resource is to test people either talking about drive through or anything else we will do it but i think it's right now what we are dealing with it's uh, in my opinion that's not where the resource uh, should be prioritized Uh, and on a different note, um, earlier it was around eight to nine percent of all people who tested positive would end up in the hospital at some point um, during the course of their illness. Uh, has that number changed at all, or is it around the same? Um, that's a good question. I would want to say that we are probably. Uh, Yeah, I'll have to get back to you on that, but I would say that it should still be the same. I'll have to ask my EPI to look at that number and maybe I'll just send that uh, note back to you. Okay, thank you. Any questions from the Windsor Star? Yes, good morning, doctor. Good morning, Teresa. Doctor, you mentioned that you would like the provincial and federal lab to, uh, to, to do investigation and uh, Determine whether or not the COVID-19 variant present in the United Kingdom is here in Windsor, Essex. What does it take to get them to do that work and give us that answer? Um, honestly, Taylor, I don't know the answer, but I will try to connect with my colleagues at this time. I'm sure that they have some uh, some protocol in how they are looking for that variant. Uh, I'm just looking at the data and I'm just scratching my head and I'm trying to make sense out of uh, all of this based on um, the numbers and the restrictions that are already in place. But uh, I can promise that I'll reach out to them, I'll talk to them, and I'll see if, uh, if our specimens are not being tested for that variant at this time, 
if they can be tested and um, or maybe that way we will know better. Okay, and looking at the uh, provincial vaccine rollout, um, I just want to clarify, we have healthcare workers like PSWs and nurses who work for private organizations and they provide community care. They go to people's homes, some of them who have COVID-19 and, and take care of them. Um, people who had probably uh, chronic health conditions where they required in-home care. Are those workers eligible for vaccination in phase one or would they be vaccinated in the second phase when it opens up to a broader stream of healthcare workers? Uh, great question, Taylor, and that's why I, I, you will see, we'll be sending out a media release today as well in just a, uh, terms of clarifying some of these concerns. What I can tell you is obviously the guidelines right now and the priority from the province right now is to vaccinate everyone in the long-term care home and retirement home. And then more broadly, they're talking about the congregate living <laughs> setting. So if people are going into the homes of people, that's not a congregate living, it's their private homes. We're talking about a congregate living setting, such as the shelters or other places that has seniors in them, that has a senior population. So there is that criteria that it has to be a congregate living, that means many people with many shared spaces, and then with seniors in it. And that's the population that will be protected. It's not, we are not there yet. We are not given the direction and neither, neither we have the vaccine to do that. So we are not given the direction there to do that. And when it comes to the rest of the healthcare worker, and that's why it's important that we have to be very clear in terms of what the priority matrix is, which of these healthcare workers are prioritized. Every healthcare worker, in my opinion, needs to get vaccinated but at what timing, especially when you have limited supply of vaccine. So we have to be really critical that what we are what we are talking about. And as much as everyone, each one of us have a case to make that why I should get the vaccine, we have to stick to an ethical framework that was released and that's been out there. We have to follow the provincial priorities. We have to follow the guideline that's provided by the National Advisory Committee on Immunization on who to vaccinate first given the limited supply. When it comes to mass vaccination, when we're talking about anyone and everyone, that's a completely different story. But what we're talking about still is the prioritization and those individuals, as you're refer referencing the healthcare workers, Taylor, they are not a priority at this time. Okay, thank you. Any questions from Amy Hunter? Dr. Ahmed, in your first comment, you said you've been hearing executives are getting the vaccine. Is that senior uh, leadership teams in our area at different facilities, is that boards? What can you share with us when you meet, when you say executives? I, I don't have uh, the data to provide that, uh, Rob, but uh, what I heard even in the news that uh, some, I, if some senior leadership based on their critical function are getting the, uh, the vaccine I don't know, like it, that's, that's, that's not right. And I wanna make sure that that's clear. We have heard complaints, concerns from other healthcare workers that who's getting the vaccine when they don't even work with patients or when their work with patient is minimal. And uh, when there are other people who are really wanna talk about the population that they serve, that's a difficult, that's a difficult thing to do. And that's required a careful thought out process of how do you do that? And again, I, I, I don't wanna beat the bush, but by saying that when we are talking about some of these prioritization and some of these planning, it, it does require some thoughtful consideration. And if just based, based on senior leadership, every one of my senior leadership member is critical to our operation. I cannot imagine if someday any of our senior leadership team member gets sick or is unable to work, what would happen to our operation? And same, as I mentioned, there are other critical services. There are police, there are fire, there's EMS, there is, uh, there is uh, uh, hydro services. There are a number of other municipal services, critical municipal services that are essential. We cannot just make an arbitrary decision based on what I think. There has to be a consistency. There has to be some ethical distribution and a lot of that is coming directly from the province and which we all agree because they are 
scientific and evidence-based using the ethical lens that we all should use. Teresa, yesterday you told us only a few of your nurses that are administering the vaccine have received it. I guess, have you heard from the remaining nurses that are going into these homes and they're hearing and they're seeing that these individuals are receiving the vaccine and they're not receiving it. Are you hearing their frustration? Are they questioning why they have not received the vaccine? Are you asking about our nurses? Like, like our health unit nurses specifically? Yes, I believe yesterday you said only oh. a few have received yeah. the vaccine. So I'm guessing when they hear about others in the community that are not doing what they're doing, receiving the vaccine, are they questioning it? Um, I, I can't speak for them personally, but I think they're really involved with just getting the job done. And we do have a process in place and uh, they know that at the end of the immunization clinic, when everyone else has been vaccinated, if there's any remaining vaccine, that they would be able to use it. So I think right now we have uh, seven nurses that have been um, that are vaccinated with the first dose of Moderna. And our group right now is a small group. So we have, I believe, probably 12 people in total. So they're, they're getting there, but they really are focused on, on getting the work done. So I haven't heard anything specifically, um, you know, from them about that issue. Okay, thank you. Any further questions from CTV? No, thank you. CBC? Sorry, CBC? No, yeah, thank you. Uh, Blackburn? No, thank you. Windsor Star? Yes, doctor. We had a question from a reader who's wondering why childcare facilities are able to operate at what seems like full capacity when classrooms, uh, in-class learning is not allowed. Can you just speak to that and then why uh, child care facilities continue to operate at that capacity? Well, I think what, uh, again, that's, uh, that's where some people are obviously more focused on their, their personal feelings and their personal uh, concerns. The child care facilities have been in operation since the beginning of this pandemic, even when everything was closed, even though um, right now we are in lockdown, but it may not be the same as what we have what we have had in the in the first wave in the early parts of the pandemic child care facility continued to stay open. And the purpose of this child care facility is to have that service for the essential workers who are providing that support to the community and because of their um, um, them not having that ability, healthcare workers, other essential workers, if they don't have the ability, they cannot go to work. And if they cannot go to work, the, 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 the pandemic response will be affected. That's why there are strict guidelines, strict criteria on how these childcare facilities should stay open. And that's what, that's why they're open. And they are following all those strict guidelines, any changes, anything that happens that would make us think about closing down these child care facilities, that would happen. But right now, based on what we have, we don't have any indication uh, to, to do anything different with the child care facility at this time. Okay, thank you. Any further questions from AM800? No, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good weekend.